Good afternoon, everyone. I am Naomi Kovacs. I'm the executive director of Santa Barbara Village, and I am um, thrilled to be here today with an amazing group of speakers and with an incredible audience. It's great to see the room packed. It shows interest in what we're doing. Um, I obviously think what we're doing is very important, and it's nice to see that the community does, too. I would say for someone who doesn't know what the village is, um, it's really, in a nutshell, it's a, it's a support system. It's a resource for people as they age if they want to continue living in their own home. How many of you, before I start, uh, heard about Santa Barbara Village in some way before you heard about this particular event? Okay, so there's a nut, that's great, oh, I love it. The more we do this, the more hands I see raised. Um, but there were still a number of hands that were down, so that's great, that means that some of you, this is your first introduction to Santa Barbara Village and what the Village Movement is. So this is a great, um, perfect introductory event for you to come to. <clears throat> Excuse me, so um, I just want to uh, introduce who our speakers will be today, and you'll hear more from from them. On the my far right here is Jolene Fossbinder. She is the program officer for the Archstone Foundation, which is a granting organization you'll hear more about, and they're a very important funder of ours. And next to her is Dr. Andy Sharlock. He is the director of the Center for the Advanced Stu Study of Aging Services at the School of Social Wel Welfare at UC Berkeley. And um, he's got some really interesting information to share with us today on their studies on the village movement. Next to him is Candace Baldwin, and she is the Director um, of Strategy for Aging and Community for both the Village to Village Network and NCD Capital Impact. And you'll hear about those organizations in a little bit. And next to Candace, right here next to me, is, is Paul Didier. He is um, the chair of our governing body, and he is also widely known as the CEO and President of the United Way of Santa Barbara County. So we have an excellent group of people who will be talking to you. I am going to start off the afternoon by giving you a little history and kind of a where are we now of Santa Barbara Village. Now what we're going to do in today's session is um, actually let the speakers go through their presentations and we'll have a, a panel of all of us at the end for you to out ask your questions. So just if you have questions or comments, kind of hold on to them until the end and we'll, we'll get to them. And afterward we'll be around so that you can mingle and talk to us as well. So with no further ado, I would like to um, launch into talking about Santa Barbara Village. My first question though, and I, I always ask this when I do outreach presentations, how many of you are thinking, I cannot wait to move into an assisted living facility? <laughs> <laughs> One hand. <laughs> and why is that? Oh, she, she's talking about the assisted living. So not a facility, but in more in a community setting, right. Yeah. And um, this is a very typical response that I get. Um, usually it's crickets when I say that, like, who can't wait? Everyone's like, are you crazy? <laughs> well, um, AARP studies have shown over the years consistently that um, seniors, 65 and older, if at all they have the choice, they want to age in their homes. They don't really want to move into a nursing facility if they, if they don't have to. Sometimes it just takes a little help to make that happen. So the village movement is really taking off. Santa Barbara Village here locally, um, this is our mission. It's a long mission, so I'm just going to summarize it. We basically help local seniors successfully age in place. And that means continue to live your life in your home with the extra help that we can give you to make that easier for you to do. There was a New York Times article, I think it was, that talked about Beacon Hill Village, and it just opened the floodgates. That everybody said, oh, we want this in our community, and wouldn't it be great if we had that? We were, a um, little history here, we were born from the vision of, a, really a community vision, but four local community groups really stepped forward and said, let's see if this might really work here, and if, if so, let's make it happen. And so that was the Jewish Federation of Greater Santa Barbara, the AARP local chapter, the Center for Successful Aging, and the United Way of Santa Barbara County. 
and um, it was a, a few year process, and um, it came to the point where we said, let's make this happen. And so how are we gonna make that happen? And the Jewish Federation stepped forward and said, we'll, we'll act as the fiscal sponsor, which basically means they're incubating us for the time being, and we're working under their nonprofit status and um, working as an organization under that umbrella. But we also really work in conjunction with the other organizations, and um, it's been an amazing, amazing journey and amazing relationship. So why start Santa Barbara Village? I mentioned the AARP studies. Well, locally, the United Way of Santa Barbara County also did. Um, uh, how many of you heard of the Power of Partnership Initiative, Poppy? A few of you. Um, it, it was what, Paul, was this about five years ago, six years ago? 06 to 09 was a study that they did in the county looking at sort of three main groups, children, families, and seniors. So in the senior part, they were looking at, well, what is basically the, the biggest desire that ha an unmet need of seniors in our community? And the number one thing that came forward was, we want to continue aging in our homes, but there really aren't enough resources to allow us and help us to do that. At the same time, Dr. Beverly Shudlowski and um, Dr. Elizabeth Wolfson were working on this idea of maybe bringing vill a village to Santa Barbara, and it all just really came together, and that's sort of how the village ended up being born. So, you know, we're here to meet that key need, that, that need that, that was expressed through the Poppy Initiative and through AARP studies, and to, to do that by providing a rich array of valuable services and programs for our members. People are wanting something different. Um, it's not the same model that a lot of people thought of, you know, back in the day. Well, you get older and you go to a nursing home. Um, one of my, the favorite quotes that I've heard recently from someone was, um, we don't write into the scripts of our lives that we're going to end it in a nursing home. Um, it's not just about helping you in your home, it's also about helping you in your whole life, in all the aspects. So your desire to stay mentally alert and to keep learning and to be socially involved, um, all of that. You know, we, we don't look at parceling out pieces of people's lives. It's sort of a, a big picture. And it's really thrilling. We're part of a national movement. And that's why this event was called the Village Movement. There is a national movement. You're going to hear more about it later today. And we were really lucky that a group of strong initial funders really helped us get going. And you see them up here. But without them, we would, we would probably not be here. So what does it mean to be a member of Santa Barbara Village? Well, it means that you have access for, we like to say it's less than the cost of a latte a day. <laughs> you can get access to discounted vetted, vetted service providers that you know, we take the time so you don't have to open the yellow pages and go, well, I guess I'll have Joe Plummer come in my house. I don't know anything about him. Um, and they'll give you a discount on their services, and we have a relationship with them. Um, we have a great support network for a wide variety of things. Our members call us for all sorts of information and questions and support. We do social activities, social connections. We do other events and programs, educational workshops and such. We have a great group of volunteers. In fact, we have a few of our volunteers in the audience. Do you guys want to raise your hand? We have Mitch and Adrian here. Um, without our volunteers, we would not be able to, to do the services that we do. So our volunteers help with a, a wide variety of things from transportation to grocery shopping to helping in the home to changing light bulbs to doing friendly calls to make sure you're okay. We have a low-cost transportation program. Um, and we offer a big thing that a lot of our members realize is a value is the peace of mind. And it's not just for them, it's also for their families, knowing that there's one place that somebody can call and that the staff know you and they care about you and um, they can coordinate a lot of different things for you in one, it's a one-stop shop. Um, basically, to be eligible, you have to be 50 or better. You have to live you know, between Carpentry and Goleta. And if you are a low-income senior, we have a scholarship program. And if anyone's interested in that, I can talk to you about it separately. And we also really like to work to assess to make sure that it's going to be a good fit because sometimes we have people who um, might look at this as a, you know, I can call and I want you to meet my needs within the hour and I want a personal chef every day and I want to 
so far, and we, we can't offer that, but we can offer a lot. So we really work with people before they join to make sure that there's a fit there. Our volunteers do get background checked. If they're driving, they also get a DMV check. And um, we do an interview process and all of that, and they help with a lot of things. Um, what I want to point out on this slide really is Karen, who's a member of ours, joined, and she has just been thrilled. She keeps telling us, I can't tell you what a difference it has made in my life. She has some health issues where it would take her weeks to do four uh, errands, and Kate will do that for her in one weekend. And then she said to us, this gives me time to actually work on getting better on uh, my health issues. So we're really making a difference for her. Um, I, this is an interesting thing I hear a lot. I, don't, I think this might be a scam or something, because why would anybody want to volunteer and freely give their time to do those things? Well, the main two reasons we hear are, I volunteer to pay it forward. I'm paying it forward. I'm going to need it myself, and I think it's a great thing, so that's what I'm doing. We also hear, you know, I wish this was here when my mom was still alive. I couldn't give this to my mom, so I'm going to be there for somebody else's mom. I'm going to do that. Our low-cost ride program I mentioned, our volunteers are they're screened and cleared, and, and um, you know, that's a big piece of what we offer is that transportation. And our vetted service providers, there's a, you know, I won't go through the list, but it's a wide variety of types of services that we get. We vetted them, and they'll give you a discount. And then we do social activities. We do at least one or two a month. Um, we have a core group of people who we see all the time, and then some who kind of come in and out of those. It's really nice to see them. We do workshops on a wide variety of things, different presentations. Um, and we've been in the paper a lot, and we do a lot of different things. So um, it's nice to see the word getting out, to see people who didn't know about us must have seen us in the paper. I love this. Research. We're finally getting research on the village movement. And um, Dr. Andy Sherlock is with us to talk about this. So you're going to hear some hot off the press stats about how villages are actually changing people's lives. And people always say, well, what does that mean, less than a latte a day? Um, I'll, I'll, we have information in the back of the room you can take that has all this information. But it's, you know, a regular membership, $79 a month. If you were to use average of one hour of volunteer help a week, um, basically anything on top of that, you're making a profit on the value of the financial value. That's not even talking about the peace of mind value. And then if you're a charter member, we still have charter memberships available. It's 10% off the full year cost. And we, we also have a scholarship program, as I said. So low-income seniors who qualify as we have funds available um, only need to pay $10 a month. So that's a really great program for them. First year in review, and I'm almost done here. Um, 2012, we, we really fully launched January 1st of 2012. And um, we really got to see, we tracked everything. Over 200 hours of volunteer help, over $5,300 of special perks. We have a relationship with arts and lectures at UCSB. Every now and then they just give us free tickets for our members. Um, that's an example. We did you know, a lot of referrals to providers, a lot of rides, a lot of member requests built, social events, workshops. So it's, it's really exciting to be able to launch and at the end of the year look at that and say, wow, we really <coughs> did do a lot in that first year. And then um, real quick, I just the other day looked and I said, let's compare year one to the first quarter of year two. And I thought, wow. So we had over 200 hours of volunteer hours in 2012. And in 20, the first year, quarter of 2013, January through March, we already had over 115. So already 57% of what we did in 2012 to, altogether. Over 420 member services um, requests filled in 2012, and we're already at 49% of that number just January through March. So total, January, since we opened, we have served over, given over 320 hours of volunteer time and filled over 625 requests of members for things like rides or help at the home or whatever. And there are a number of ways to get involved in the village. Whether you think, I might want to become a member, or I have I know somebody who might, or I'm part of a church group, or a temple group, or a homeowners association. I want you guys to come out and tell people about it. We're happy to come out and do outreach um, presentations. Become a supporter. We are not um, solely supported on membership dues alone. 
so we do need extra support so any extra help is always welcomed. We do need to seek funding. Um, we are right now really thinking about launching a, a corporate sponsorship program um, to strengthen our relationship with businesses in the community and also because businesses are really seeking um, senior consumers. We greatly appreciate it. Volunteers, right now we actually are getting so much requests from our members and such an influx in requests of potential members, we really need to beef up our, our, member, our volunteer base. So if you're interested, we would love to hear from you after this presentation. And most of our, a lot of our events we do um, open to the public, so sign up for our newsletter if you're not already signed up for it, and you'll hear about a lot of the events coming up that even if you're not a member, you can come to. And that's in a little bit more than a nutshell, sort of the history of the village and where we are right now locally. But I want to turn our attention then to our next speaker, who's going to talk more about the village movement as a whole, the larger movement that we're a part of, and um, that is Candace Baldwin. Now Candace has come out from Virginia to be with us, so um, we greatly appreciate that. I've been in California all week. Yeah. And I know it was hard. She said, what, Santa Barbara? Really? I have to go to Santa Barbara? And I have a free day on Saturday in Santa Barbara? So, the best weekend ever. Thank you very much. I'm quite excited about it. And my name is Candace Baldwin. I'm the Director of Strategy for Aging and Community for NCB Capital Impact, but more importantly, the Village to Village Network nationally, which is a national peer-to-peer -peer network that was started for villages to support the growth of the village movement across the country. So I'm so excited to um, have an opportunity to share with you what's happening, why this is such a relevant time for the villages right now, why this model and what you're doing here is so cutting edge and innovative and really informing a huge movement and, and, and you're part of a larger group. So this is not just a bunch of people in Santa Barbara that got together and thought this was a great idea, even though it is. It, you're not alone, so don't think that you're the crazy people just sitting over here on an island doing your thing. Um, and if you want to feel like that and that's what works for you, then go right ahead. Early pioneers um, are really creating a message of uh, and, and blazing a trail uh, that allows uh, new villages to grow and expand and replicate. I'm not going to stop you. Um, but what's really interesting is it's the evolution of aging population in our country right now. There's 78 individuals over the age of 65 and you know 65 is, becomes that like that, that, that ceiling, that, that, that cusp, that, the hill that everybody has to climb over or something. And unfortunately, in our country, we, for some reason, everybody over the age of 65 becomes a homogenous group. <laughs> Um, which is so not true and that you know just because you're an individual at 65 does not mean that you're not an individual at 68 or 67 or wherever you want to go and so what what we have in this uh, what we have is an opportunity to really change the face of how aging services and supportive services and communities serve the individuals over that age population but also to champion the individuality of that we're also finding that individuals um, start turning 65 every day 10,000 individuals will turn 65 every day for the next 18 years. Yeah, let that sink in for just a second. It's a lot of people. And then the bottom falls out. Um, no, what, <laughs> what's really exciting is that this is a force of nature. You all are a force in the, in the economy and the changing and shaping the face of system as well as the fact that these are individuals who are baby boomers that are not going quietly into the night and will never follow what anybody told them to do to begin with. Um, so that's really what's exciting about the village model is that it really is championing the individuality. We also are finding the 85 and older group becoming the great largest population growth um, of that age sector. And so that's also going to really impact our health care costs, our systems. Just the sheer size alone, um, our current system cannot cannot serve anybody's need, everyone's needs. And so something has to change. And what's really exciting is that the village model is that something that we're seeing is really changing. When we talk about aging and community, this is not just looking at one slice. This is not just healthcare. It's not just housing. It's not just aging services. If you think of all the things that went into your getting you ready today, you live in a house. You have a roof over your head. You had transportation to get here. This is an activity that you chose to do that is outside of your home as opposed to something else that you could have done today, which we really appreciate that. So think about all of those components that go into your day 
Those are the components of when we talk about a systems change in aging and community, it's all of these components. It's having access to affordable and accessible housing, and that's defined by what affordable to you, what is affordable to you. It's having an opportunity to engage in your community, to meet other people, to get out and do something exciting and offer either your value um, and your talents to your community, but also to get things in, in return for that. It also allows you to have access to health and well-being um, prevention services so that you can continue to be healthy and, and active in your community, as well as have autonomy and independence. It's interesting whenever when, you, when Naomi asks you who's ready to go to an assisted living facility, it's okay to say, you know, that's my choice. That might not be my neighbor's choice, but that might be my choice. And that's what makes us all individuals. And so when we talk about aging and community, when we talk about choice and independence, we need to talk about choices and they need to be available in every community. And that's what villages offer. Our healthcare systems change um, and the focus on really decreasing or eliminating hospital readmissions and the cost of health care to our local economy, village, villages can actually provide that um, opportunity to stop gap measures. The communities uh, in our, in our, across our nation and our world are strengthened by aging adults staying in their community and being active. You have so much to offer to guide what is aging your primary informants of what it means to age. And if anybody wants to build a policy or a program or a system around that, they should be asking you as to what that is. And so the village gives you that voice. It gives that opportunity for you to shape what aging and age-friendly and livability in your community looks like in Santa Barbara. And so don't think that this is just an um, organization where you get to sign up and you pay some money and maybe someone will come and give you services. But you also have a responsibility as a member to also raise your voice and have a, a platform to do that within the village to, to contribute to how the f future of Santa Barbara is shaped as far as aging. So why would people join? You know, really it's about a sense of belonging. It's a sense of individuality. It's who I am and what I need. But it's also a place where I can come and give support and get support. I live alone. I'm I, a single woman. I live alone. I can't hem my pants to save my soul. <laughs> nor am I tall enough to buy off the rack. So, you know, I have some need. It doesn't make me an invalid. It doesn't make me that I'm, I'm, you know, not able to do anything else for myself. I just need someone to hem my pants. But for that, I can drive, I can pick up milk, I can go do all kinds of things. And so there's an exchange of value that comes from being able to provide the talents to someone else. But also, you know, we ask, we, I think we, we raised in a generation where you know, asking for help is a sign of weakness. That's not true. Asking for help means that you're giving someone else the opportunity to give to you and pay it forward. So thinking about it that way. As well as an opportunity to explore your bucket list. What didn't you get to? What do you want to do now? Your life's not over. I mean, my mom says she's in her second encore, her, her second adulthood at 75. She's got a few more years and she's ready to go 25 years strong. So. She's got some things to do and some time to do it in. The village provides that opportunity in a lot of different ways. It builds stronger communities. By keeping people paying their taxes, property taxes within the community, the community is able to get uh, the benefit from that. You have preferred providers lists that are provided through the village, and that gives you a discount provided, but it also it means that you're buying local. You're supporting the local economy and the local businesses because you're buying from them. You're also providing an opportunity for health and wellness and what is the model for successful aging, as well as providing an opportunity through this as a membership-based organization that you have a right to be a part of the governance. You have a, part, a right to say, and these are the activities, and here's what I can do, and I'd like to start a walking club. Let's go do that. You know, it, it, it also builds local leadership within your communities as well, and that everyone has an important component and role and responsibility in the community, which is very exciting. So now that I've sold you on the village model, let me tell you about what things are happening across the country. So the heart of the village is really at the membership. It's, it's the member, and they really guide that. And some of the things that villages have been doing nationally are, a couple, are really exciting. I pulled a few here. There are so many to choose from. It was hard. Um, what I think is really great about At Home Chesapeake and what they offer is that every one of their members has an aging plan. You enter in as a member, 
You might be in your 50s, early 60s, mid 70s, healthy, active, I don't need any help, I'm not there, I'm not ready yet, I don't need anybody to help me, but I can offer something to the, to, to the community. And so through an aging plan, it, when you're healthy, you get to decide, are you going to be an assisted living facility? Are you going to move to something to that? What do you see yourself doing? And how can the village make sure that they fulfill all of that so that your, your plan is your plan, so that you're, there's no question as things happen through your life episodically or whatnot, your family is well informed to you, and, and you get to have your wishes known. The Village Advocate Network being built by San, uh, San Francisco Village is really exciting at creating um, caring circles you know, during episodic challenges so that if you do have knee replacement, if you do have um, a short-term hospital stay, that you can go back to your home. This does not automatically push you into a nursing home. It should be allow you to transition. And what are the services that can, villages can wrap around? Because sometimes when you have a hip replacement, you can get all the prescriptions to physical therapy and occupational therapy and all, your, all of these things, but on the back of your mind, who's going to walk my dog? That's the most important thing that bothers you every day. And so the village can really fill that role. Um, so what's exciting is the growth of the village movement. We have over 100 villages operating, serving over 20,000 individuals over the age of 55 across the nation. It's very exciting. And this is a growth that has, has, has exploded in the last three years. The Village to Village Network was critical to replicating and sustaining this model. We are a joint partnership between NCB Capital Impact and Beacon Hill Village, which was the first village we ever created in the country. And together, as a partnership, we work to promote and sustain the model to provide our services to our members who are the villages. So we're a village of villages. We provide services to our members just as much as you do at the local level. And it really provides an opportunity to, to be a, a collective movement um, and to strengthen each other. We um, it launched in 2010 and currently have 230, it's been updated since the last I typed in this slide a few weeks ago, 230 organizations in 38 states and four countries. So we're also international, which is really exciting. I've had the pleasure of being able to be in Amsterdam and meeting our members there, as well as I recently went to Australia um, three weeks ago and got to be there. So I'm never home, mind you. Um, I need a village just to care for my storage unit, which is essentially an apartment. Um, it stores my stuff. Um, but we, through the village, we provide tools and resources. We create an opportunity for peers across the country to exchange knowledge and, and really just a place where people can go. We've exploded the village um, movement. And when we launched in 2010, there were 50 open villages. We've doubled that in three years. And it's continuing to grow. My belief is that villages will be robust. Um, there may be 100 villages within a community. I mean, it could be really uh, within a state having so many. This is not just one village in each state or one in each you know community. It could be in a community have three or four villages operating in different neighborhoods depending on the size of the communities. What's really great is the Archstone Foundation's investment into the village movement in California has been uh, substantial and actually unique. No other state has the same opportunities that you all do here, which is really exciting and it also provides a really good foundation for the state of California. In California, in, in addition to the nine villages, um, there are 21 other vill orga village organizations operating um, as far as village network members. And so there's a huge movement happening just in California alone. Well, I think what's interesting is to talk about, you know, Naomi covered a lot of the issues of what you all provide, but Consider the value of what the, the, the San, excuse me, San, Santa Barbara Village, I'm trying to really talk fairly quickly because I'm getting a little sign in the back that hooking me, I'm like, where can I go? Um, <laughs> so you get the ability to age in community, you get the social interaction, an opportunity to have an encore career, or second adulthood, an opportunity to, to shape the face of what aging is and, and livability and what your community should look like in the next five, 10 years. What's the next generation going to benefit from what you have, uh, what trail you have blazed in the future? And also as an opportunity to strengthen your community. Volunteers are the backbone of this village. What we're finding, and I think Dr. Charlock will probably talk a little bit more about this, but that a good proportion of village members actually volunteer back to their village and they are in service to each other. This concept of neighbor helping neighbor without the, the, the guarantee of reciprocation 
is really growing in this country and what's old is new again. This is what communities used to look like and, and what we need to get back to. But it's also how you keep an, in, um, an investment into your economy. So volunteers at $22 an hour on average of income and services are offering for you nearly $10,000 are being invested back into your community. And in, especially in an economy right now where no one's creating jobs, Santa Barbara Village created two. So let's talk about the investment that this organization also brings to your local economy. We have realtors who will actually um, call us and say, can you tell me where the villages are because that's a selling point for me. By knowing that there's a community around that, I can sell that opportunity. By having, you know, buying local and strengthening your local businesses, by having a preferred provider, they're going to be able to serve you better. And that's a better, I think, you know, when we talk about hometown and really local pride, that's just really where it comes into play. It also is about employee benefits and family caregivers. You know, the village isn't just about serving the person who's the member, but it's also about creating a peace of mind. Because villages are, you know, provide and champion their local members to be advocates within the community of how it, what it means to successfully age, they can actually play a role in creating more public safety awareness around older adults, um, changing the way that how long a light uh, stays, um, you know, green for their crosswalks so that the, you really are allowing individuals who may not have as quick mobility as someone who's 20 and spry um, can get across that. So there's some safety aspects that come into play with that for sure. My mom is a member of a village. She joined after, you know, my mom's 75, she walks five miles every morning, she takes two a leave. She is a very healthy individual and tripped over a manhole cover and broke her wrist. It happens, it's called an accident. And so my sister and I are able, were able to be there in the same community to provide care and services and med management, take her to the doctor's appointment, get her through surgery and all of the things. And it wasn't until one day when I was sitting there doing my village work out of her living room, because apparently I'm never home, um, and I can work anywhere, um, that she said, oh, well, if I didn't have you or your sister, I'd need a village. Oh, thank you. It was the best day ever, because finally she either, she also, A, understood what I did for a living, um, and B, you know, really got that she could really value from this. So she said, well, if I, you know, would a village take me to get my glasses fixed? Well, yes, they would. Well, would, the, would they come and cut my food because I've, you know, I've got my arm in a sling and I can't, I can't prepare food? Well, yes, they would. And so she was very excited about this, and I let her marinate on that for about a week. <laughs> and then she called me and she said, so, is there a village in Alexandria? I said, yes, they are, but please don't tell them you're my mother if you call. Um, <laughs> and then found out that they stopped, the membership they just launched in their service area stopped about two blocks from her front door. Now, and any other person would have said, well, can't you just extend? You know, I'm only two blocks. My mom's like, great, you won't be competition when I start my own, click. <laughs> so, <laughs> hence where I get it from. Um, so, yeah, so she, she did. And she got 30 members in her community all set up, and they called back, and they said, well, I think we're going to extend, you know, into your neighborhood. She's like, great, I have 30 new members for you. So, uh, so it's really exciting, and it's fun, and she enjoys it because she really just wants to find a new husband, so that's sort of kind of her thing. Um, that's really her goal at this point, which is great. Really, I just need someone to take, make sure that I, I, if I'm on the road and I'm not there, that's, you know, I know there's a peace of mind. And my, I tell you what, it's the best Mother's Day gift I ever bought for my mother, because she doesn't have to dust it, move it, pack it, or anything else. So, so I will say this, uh, the village movement, if you're not sold by it today, Please, you know, think about it. Think about what it can do for you. Um, so thank you very much, and we'll be here to answer any questions. Thank you, Candace. I'm going to cut Candace off because she has such great stuff to say always. Um, so our next speaker is going to, um, it is Jolene Fossfinder from the Archstone Foundation. And um, you've heard me mention Archstone, you've heard Candace mention Archstone. Who can follow that act, right? Oh. <laughs> you gave me sugar and caffeine, I'm ready to go. <laughs> Candace has more energy than me and my little 10 pound dog put together. <laughs> Good afternoon, my name is Jolene Fossbinder, 
and I'm a program officer with the Archstone Foundation. So as Naomi and Candace mentioned, um, the Archstone Foundation is a proud funder of the villages and the village movement. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Archstone Foundation um, and why we've gotten into the village movement and then kind of a little background about the, the pieces that we fund that are related to the um, villages, the California villages and the village movement. The Archstone Foundation is a nonprofit grant making organization. We are established in 1986. We're in Long Beach, California, and our mission is to prepare society for meeting the needs of an aging population. My background is in gerontology. I have an undergraduate and a graduate degree in gerontology. I was raised by my grandmother from the age of four, so I'm a big promoter of um, not only the field of aging, but also um, different movements and different organizations who are interested in the field of aging. Um, for over 25 years, the foundation itself has provided grants in aging. We've supported multiple efforts to um, build communities or supportive communities. We fund $5 million annually, and we fund primarily in Southern California. In June 2010, the Archstone Foundation began a supportive <coughs> Communities for Aging initiative, and our goal was to enhance the integration of aging in Southern California communities in ways that would increase the quality of life for older adults living independently in their homes in the community. I've always been interested in nonprofits, and I, this is the time of my life that a village is a wonderful <laughs> Agency, so that's what interested me. I'm glad you're here. Four California villages were funded under that initiative, including the Santa Barbara Village. In September 2011, based on the foundation's experience with those four villages, we invested $1.3 million into creating aging friendly communities through the expansion of villages. This, village, this funding is for Southern Cal or for California villages. 22 villages had applied for funding. The Santa Barbara village is one of nine that we had funded. As part of the 2011 expansion, the foundation also funded technical assistance and evaluation activities. So if you fund an initiative like the villages, you really want to be able to provide support to the staff and those that are implementing these villages. And we also want to evaluate and we want to know what kind of outcomes we're going to get. So NCB Capital Impact, you've already heard from Candace. Whoa, did we hear from Candace? <laughs> so NCB, sorry Candace. NCB Capital Impact um, provides technical assistance. The technical assistance is really one-on-one -on -one training and one-on-one -on -one support for um, directors like Naomi and support staff like Dan. We look, or Canvas and NCB Capital Impact looks at business plan development, how to market and develop programming that's beneficial and supportive of older adults in the community, and they look at how to sustain and grow the village. You'll hear more about the technical assistance um, throughout the day. The foundation also partnered with NCB or with UC Berkeley, pardon me, Andy Sharlock, who you've not heard from yet, but will. Um, Dr. Sharlock and his support staff, Carrie Graham, conduct a cross-site evaluation study of the nine villages. They document key processes, um, and they look at um, elements for sustainability. They look at member services, member satisfaction. And by evaluating the villages, we're able to really identify outcomes and successes, which Andy will talk about a bit more. So in addition to the technical assistance and the evaluation, we also support two national or two state convenings. We bring together our nine villages, and we also bring together the uh, villages, the other villages in California who are interested in attending the convening. So at this convening, they generally are two days, and Santa Barbara Village, for example, can come and they can talk about challenges that they might be having with supporting the needs of their members 
They could talk about evaluation challenges that they may be having or things that they really are interested in evaluating. Uh, and they get to talk about their successes. They get to learn from the other nine villages what their challenges and successes are. And so really we're creating a learning collaborative for the villages in California to be able to share ideas and lessons learned. Consistent with Archstone's mission, we believe that the village movement is a flexible model and we believe that it will prove to be an effective vehicle for enabling older adults to age in place. I've met new people who are part of this community and it's very impressive to see how they share. Um, I meet people from all the different agencies that I'd read about since I moved here and see that these people are allowed to come out of their job or they, and they take their own time to come and help to fight, uh, discuss the various issues that are um, important in the village, like scholar, particularly in the scholarship group. And I've been really impressed by that and seeing the quality of people who are drawn such, to such a place. We're optimistic of its progress and the nine funded villages. We encourage and support the Santa Barbara Village, Naomi and Dan, never, never, never tiring staff who continue day in and day out to come up with new and creative ideas and ways to support you all. Um, we're very happy to be a part of today. We're happy to fund the villages and we're happy to welcome you here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it has been an amazing experience for any of you who have worked in the nonprofit world and worked with grants. Um, this is the most unique grant. My, my entire career has been in nonprofits, and this was the most unique grant. Um, it, it, it has been so um, supportive, and um, they're, they're involved, and connecting us with the other villages, it really has created um, this sort of family of villages within these nine California villages that has been incredibly valuable to us. And um, in fact, we have been talking with some of those villages about doing mutual visits to different towns. So uh, Santa Monica's talking about coming up and doing some wine tasting with our members. <laughs> so um, we'll find, a, maybe we'll go down to the Getty with them or something. Um, an another piece that uh, Joni was talking about is the, the UC Berkeley study. And that has been, um, we have been long awaiting the results, at least the initial results of some of their studies. Because it really helps us understand too Really, it, it, we see, as the online staff, I see differences it's making in people's lives, in individual people's lives. But as a whole, really, how are villages changing people's lives? What are the positive impacts on people's lives? And so um, we've been a part of two studies, and there have been, I think, four studies. And um, so Dr. Sherlock is going to come up right now and talk about hot off the press some of the data that actually has finally now been collected. Um, so we, we're starting to see real empirical data about how villages are um, impacting people's lives. So thank you. Thanks, Naomi. Uh, you know, I have, the, I have the easy work. I have the easy work here uh, because uh, Naomi and Dan and some of you are in the business of making the village happen, making it work. And uh, the Archstone Foundation and Jolene Fassbinder and others are in the business of providing the, the, a little bit of financial investment, a little bit of support. Candace in the business of providing that technical assistance for Candace and Anna and her great team. I just get to come and ask people how things are going. The extent to which people's health and well-being are benefiting, even in a relatively short term. We've seen a reduction in uh, falls, a reduction in use of uh, emergency rooms. So actual health impacts we're beginning to see already. <laughs> And so that's what we do. We talk to villages, we talk to village members. We've been studying villages for, oh, I don't know, about four years now, and before that, looking at a variety of community initiatives, really based on the idea of how do we engage community members in new ways, in innovative ways, that help to address the kinds of questions and concerns and challenges that we all face throughout our lives, and particularly as we get a little bit older. I won't go into too much of the details here, and I also, I'm going to be relatively brief. Can you hold but, the mic up a bit? Yes. I'll be relatively brief and try and keep the mic moving with my head. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, 
So uh, some of the data that I'll present uh, are from um, study that we did about a year ago with villages nationally, or about 86% of villages nationally. Uh, some other data that I'll be presenting will be from uh, our uh, nine grantee villages here in California that have received support from the Archstone Foundation. If we look nationally, just to give you a picture, villages are young. The average village is only three years old. So here we have Santa Barbara Village, a little bit more than a year old. You know, you're, you're right in there with the, the range nationally. Three quarters of villages are freestanding, totally grassroots, starting from the community, starting from the base. At least Santa Barbara Village has the support of institutions here in Santa Barbara that help to, to make it a reality. And if you look nationally, about a third of villages are in urban cores, about a third are in suburban, and the other third are kind of rural or, or mixed. So it's quite a diversity. And one of the, one of the things I want to uh, underscore is the diversity of villages nationally. Of the villages that exist, the 100 or 120 or so villages that exist, the other 100, 120 or so that are in, in development, some of them are, are in urban cores, some of them are rural, some of them are part of larger organizations, some of them are off by themselves. We have time-baked models, we have spoken hub models, we have all different kinds of models. Each community designs a village that responds to the needs and the interests of the members of that community. So I want to spend a few minutes sort of providing some numbers. I'm kind of a numbers guy, but I'll also try and fill in some of the flesh and bones here as well. What the realities are, what the impacts are, what it, what it means, what are what members of villages tell us as an external uh, evaluator. Probably the, the most important thing here, if we look at village members here in California, and we ask them a very simple question, if you had a friend, who asked you, should I join your village? 86% say yes. They serve people who want to be part of something, as well as people who want their own privacy, their own separateness. They serve people who want to have social activities and social events and get together to play bridge or get together to play mahjong or get together for whatever. And they also serve people who kind of want to keep to themselves, but want to know that there's somebody there if they need to call for some help. 86% say definitely or probably. You should look into it. Now, that's pretty darn good. And one of the things we're studying, I've got to tell you, is what, what makes you part of the 86% and what makes you part of the 14%. And how much of that is you? Because villages aren't for everybody. Depends on what you're interested in, what you want, and how much of it is the village and what it provides, and the match. One of the things that Santa Barbara Village does, and Naomi mentioned, is that somebody sits down with you at the very beginning and tries to figure out what do you want, what do you need, what are you looking for, what's part of your life, and, and what can the village provide. One of the biggest impacts, one of the biggest reasons people join villages, and one of the biggest impacts throughout the state of California is the social participation, social engagement. Three quarters of village members, oh, sorry, three quarters of village members say they know more people since joining the village. And they talk to more people, they feel more connected. One thing that's kind of interesting, 40% say they leave their homes more. And we ask why, why is that? Because they have somebody to go with. They have somewhere to go and somebody to go with. And I don't know about you, but one of the things that sometimes happens is you may say, oh, I, I wish I could go or I'd like to go, that sounds interesting, but actually having somebody who to go with, to share the experience with, to share the driving with, to go at night especially, makes all the difference in the world. When we look, another reason why people join villages is simply to get some help when you need help, to be able to get somebody to hand your, your pants or help turn your mattress or reprogram the remote control, or whatever it might be. What's interesting here is eight out of 10 village members say now they know who to call. It's not necessarily that they're using those services more right now. They will eventually. But in the short run, it's not that they're necessarily using the services, but the security of knowing at least now you know where to call. It's not 
looking in the yellow pages or going online or getting a long list of people and you don't know who you can trust and who you can't trust. And here, you got people that you know you can call, you know you can depend on, you know who's going to answer the phone and that they'll be there for you. And it's interesting down here, even uh, some people say they're more likely even to get medical care, get health care, largely because of transportation, largely because they have a way to get there when they need to go without having to wait for the, for the cab or be worried about whether the cab is going to show up or the paratransit or, or whatever. When we look at the quality of one's life, majority of village members say that in one way or another, the quality of their life has improved. It may be that they go to social events and social activities and have, have the kind of interchange with people who are like themselves. It may be because they get some of their needs met that weren't being met, maybe less lonely, be happier, feel healthier, because they have somebody to walk with, somebody to do things with. And one of the things that is really a, a key for a lot of people is the security of knowing that you can continue to live in your home, in your community, for as long as you want. And 80%, 79% of village members that we talked to said that they're more likely to be able to stay in their own homes because of their membership in the village. They feel more confident they'll be able to age in place. And I thought, I just, I want to leave plenty of time for questions and, and, and discussion, but I thought I'd share with you, um, oh, uh, let's say at least one example, and I can actually think of a couple of, of, uh, of, of examples now these are the extreme, but I can think of a couple of examples where there were members of villages who broke a hip, had another health crisis, went into the hospital, and then after the hospital were told they couldn't go home, or there wasn't the supports to go home, and who ended up either in a post-acute setting like a nursing home, or about to be sent to a nursing home and where somebody called the village, it could be Santa Barbara Village, it could be a different village, but called that number and said, you know, they're about to send mom to a nursing home. Is there anything you can do? Or they said that she can't go home without support, and I can be there some of the time, but then I gotta go to work, whatever. Is there anything you can do? And where the villages organized volunteers primarily as a support network to provide the support during that period of time, that transitional period of time, until the person could get back on their feet and take care of themselves. And where because of the support from the village, this person was able, a couple of examples I can think of, able to go back to their own home, back to where they wanted to be. And I will tell you in one case, there was somebody who actually was busted out of the nursing home. I can think of a, a couple of situations where there are people who um, were literally on their way to a nursing home. They had uh, fallen or had another major health problem. They were in the hospital. Uh, they were told they couldn't go home because there was nobody there to help them. And they called the village and said, you know, I'm, I'm a member of the village. Oh, yeah, it's good to good talk to. How's everything going? Uh, well, I've got a little problem here. Uh, and where the, the, whoever was the concierge or the coordinator at the village said, let me see what I can do, and organized volunteers to help them, especially during that period when you first go home from the hospital and things are a little unsteady, you can't do everything for yourself, and where literally being a member of a village has made the difference about whether somebody could go home or not. The village team organized itself, went into that facility and said, we're out of here. <laughs> okay. There's all kinds of issues of liability and whatever. Yeah. But, but I want to leave you, though, with the idea that a village can be what you make it. That it can really be the kind of support, the kind of, not place, but, but place where you feel, it's not a physical place, but a social place, where you feel like you're, you're part of something bigger than yourself, that can really be there over the long haul. And ultimately, as much as I can present data and all that, ultimately, ask a village member. Ask somebody who's a member of Santa Barbara Village. Ask them what their experience is. And that's where you really learn for yourself. 
whether this is something that makes sense for you. So anyway, thank you for giving me a few minutes to share with you. <laughs> Well, wow, Andy, that, that was the perfect segue to the next um, piece of this afternoon. Um, and it's, so, it's really wonderful to see the data and actually to see what the results are showing us. Um, but what Andy was just talking about is, you know, it's great to see the data. It's also really nice to hear from somebody who's experiencing it. So we actually have asked a couple of our members that are um, going to share with you right now their experience um, since joining the village, you know, why they joined and um, what the village has done in terms of um, in affecting their lives. So Ruth Sack is going to be our first uh, member to share with you her experience. We have a, a number of members in the audience, I, well, at least a few. So if you are a member, would you be willing to raise your hand and just show us who's we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of our members, or eight of our members here right now. So um, Ruth was one of our original members. She joined before we even opened our doors. She was one of what we call our visionaries. She said, this sounds like a great idea. I'm going to join, and let's, let's see what happens. So Ruth is going to take just a couple minutes and share her experience with you. I joined uh, because I live alone. My family is spread across the country. And I was concerned about um, things happening to me where I would not have any help. Okay, is this better? Yeah. <laughs> um, I was one of the original uh, joiners. And um, part of the reason was that um, many of my friends had already entered the uh, retirement villages, <laughs> and I didn't want to go. <laughs> so I heard about the uh, Santa Barbara Village starting, and I had heard about the one in Maryland, I think was the original. Uh, and I was very impressed with it. So I joined, and uh, it made a big difference because I had more social activities. I was more willing to go to different events. I met a group of people that I could socialize with. There was a book club that I joined. So it made a big difference in my overall enjoyment of life. And um, in December, I had an emergency and I was at the hospital. And I called Dan and told him where I was. He came immediately to visit. And he asked what he could do for me. And I told him that I had to cancel my newspaper. And I had to cancel an appointment that I had, which he did for me. That was a big difference for me. My daughter was in Ohio, and she was ready to fly home. I said, you don't need to do that. I have help here. <laughs> she came two weeks later. And it was a wonderful experience, and uh, I would suggest it for anybody who is in this situation. Uh, alone and elderly, I'm physically okay. I'm still driving. I can take care of my uh, shopping and my appointments and my house. I have a lady who comes to help me. And um, so the whole experience of the Santa Barbara Village is wonderful for me. I hope it would be for someone else. So the next member who is going to um, share with you her experience is Lori Hull Smithers. And um, Lori, if you would come on up here. Sorry for the tight squeeze there. Lori's going to share with you her experience. I am not only the producer of filming this event, <laughs> but I am also the producer and host of the TV show Our View on Channel 17. And the co-host of that with me is Jean Nickel, who I am 85, and she is even older than I am. <laughs> so we're two senior citizens really enjoying um, do our TV show on Channel 17. Now, <clears throat> before that, my husband, William Smithers, and I had a TV show called Just Between Us. And that's up on the internet, SB Just Between Us. 
And one of our most worthwhile, finest interviews was of Naomi Kovacs about Santa Barbara Village. As a matter of fact, Bill and I were so impressed that we joined. <laughs> now, uh, I wish we could have had Santa Barbara Village uh, several years ago when I had two hip replacements and broken and a thyroid removed. And we can, could see the advantage of being members at our ages. Now, in December, I was in New Orleans visiting my son and family and keeping up with my career teaching acting lessons, which I do in New Orleans and Santa Monica with my daughter. And I had a call from Bill, who was in the hospital. He had had a small stroke. And I said, oh, I'll come home immediately. And he said, no, 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 don't change your ticket. Uh, I have called uh, Santa Barbara Village, and then they're here for us. And I said, okay, I'm going to call them too. So I think we both talked to Naomi. Now, Bill busted out of the hospital. <laughs> he was so eager to come home that he talked the doctor into letting him come home earlier than I had thought they should. And it was okay if he had someone at home with him. So immediately he called Naomi of Santa Barbara Village. And even though it was late in the afternoon, she had someone there who was with him until I came home. The hospital sent him home in a special cab that they get for people. Now, I think that we have used Santa Barbara Village for many reasons, handymen. And uh, when I teach with my daughter in Santa Monica and at our uh, acting studio, uh, Dan is right there calling Bill to be sure he's okay. As a matter of fact, Dan, uh, he was hospitalized another time, and uh, my daughter and I just came right back. But we knew that all was well because Santa Barbara Village was also contacted, and, and Dan was checking on Bill. So I say thank you. <laughs> Thank you to Naomi, Dan, and Santa Barbara Village. And if any of you have questions to ask me in the question period, I'll be happy to answer them. It's a wonderful organization, and I hope we can stay in our own home for as long as we want. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Lori's story um, also is a great story in how it sort of we involve um, our providers as well because the person that I was able within an hour on the phone call when Bill called me, what she didn't say is he called um, near the end of the day on the Friday before the long Christmas weekend. <laughs> I got the call and he said, hi, and I said, what are you up to? And he said, I'm at cottage. And I said, hope you're visiting somebody and you're just killing time. And he said, no, I had a stroke. And, and so, I, I arrived in Santa Barbara the day before Christmas. Yes. <laughs> and Lori was ready to get on the plane and we said it, it's okay. And um, the hospital allowed him to leave, as she said, because we had lined up one of our in-home care providers who was able to um, do an assessment of him and provide um, their paid services at a discount for him so that Lori could continue to enjoy the Christmas vacation with her kids and that he had the care he needed with us checking on him. So um, we were really happy to be able to line that all up. And um, we're really happy when we hear stories like Ruth's. Um, we have one member story. She's not here today, but I, um, she was willing to share. So I'm going to quickly share her story. She joined and she said, I don't, I don't think, I mean, I'm still driving, but I, I really probably shouldn't be. And I said, oh, hello, oh, oh. And um, she said, but I'm going to join, and I'm going to see how it goes. I'm going to use you for other things. And, but it's good to know that when I stop driving, you have a ride program. And I said, well, why don't you pretend like you don't have a car for a month and try to use our program and see. Don't get rid of your car. Don't get rid of your lights. Just see. How's it going to work for you? And she said, oh, OK, I'll try it. I don't know if that's going to work, but OK. And uh, about a month or five weeks later, she called me and she said, I just want you to know, I just sold my car and I just took away my own license and um, I'm probably a lot safer for it and, 
everybody on the road is probably a little safer for it too. And um, she uses our ride program now to take her to her weekly exercise class at the Y and to come to our social events and go to doctor's appointments and such. And she was so afraid of giving up her license because it would isolate her and she wouldn't be able to get to where she needed and she wouldn't be able to take care of grocery shopping. And uh, we've been able to help her do that and she now feels safer. And um, I feel safer. If she's telling me that I wasn't safe on the road with her on the road, I'm glad we could help her with that. We've taken off and we're meeting their needs in many ways, but we want to know from them how else can we fine tune it? What else can we be doing? Um, within the resources that we that we have and if we don't can they help us expand the resources as well so we want their input on things that they'd like to see us doing um, we want their input on things that are important to them so that we can start addressing them if, if possible we we do ultimately uh, we would like to see a group of our members getting together to form sort of an advocacy committee to talk about senior issues. So there's a lot of really different individual stories that then make up those statistics that we saw. And it's really um, amazing being part of it. And so I want to give us a chance to have some um, question and answer period. So I'm going to ask all our, <coughs> our speakers, including Paul, who did not speak um, because I was the one who shared our history. But Paul, as our governing body chair and as having been involved in this community, uh, in nonprofits and the seniors for so long. He is an incredible resource for us. So I'd love you all to scoot over this way. So if you have any questions, it can be on whatever sort of triggered your interest. I will come over and just wait for me to get over to you. In Santa Barbara, I would like to know how the village is going to function in reference to our SVP. I have belonged to our SVP for more than 25 years. I mean, not in Santa Barbara only, that was San Luis Obispo. And some years I have put 1,000 hours of volunteer work in schools and hospitals, and you say there is no reciprocity. I just would like to know how that works. Um, I, I think the point is that, that often there is reciprocity, and we're hoping for reciprocity. Um, in terms of RSVP, some of you may not know, um, RSVP is a local nonprofit organization that engages retired um, senior service professionals who then volunteer their time. They don't want to just sit at home, so they might have accounting experience or computer experience or whatever it is, and they will go out and they will um, volunteer time either for nonprofits or for individual businesses. Um, so we actually partner with them, and they actually help recruit volunteers for us sometimes, um, or we'll reach out to them and say, we need a volunteer who does X, Y, Z. We're getting requests for this. So um, we're not duplicating. We're actually trying to partner with. And uh, we would love more, more help. As I said, we're, we're actively recruiting volunteers right now. Okay. Hi, am I the newest member? Yes, I thought so. Last week. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm still singing professionally. I'm still driving, and I thought, what do I need this for? But I was lonely and isolating at home, and I think a lot of seniors have done that. But I refuse to be old till I say I'm old, and I said, I'm not singing yet. <laughs> and I'm 71 and proud of it. That's right. I love that. I have a very specific question. I'm, I have learned to <laughs> So it's too difficult to speak, but I'm not contagious. <laughs> I, I was very interested in going into a retirement the ability when my 87-year-old husband died, but I, I find that attitude towards people who are handicapped is very difficult. I'd like to know the position of dealing with the village people, dealing with people who have 
So the, the question is, how does the village deal um, with people with handicaps? She um, had the experience of what, her 87-year-old husband passed away in a in a nursing facility. No, and you, no. Oh, he, he did. He, he's he's still alive. Oh, okay. She, she is a, she is aphasic. Right. Besides her laryngitis and uh, her mobility, uh, it, it, it is definitely right. So she's concerned about. Um, she mentioned moving into a facility that um, sometimes there's. Uh, that there's difficulty with that. Sometimes there's prejudice with that. Sometimes you know you might they be treated different. So, so she she wants to have a village actually might be able to help someone who has some disabilities. Being involved in what I call community building and community change, because this form of service requires nonprofits, public agencies, funders, and volunteers to think of services in a very different way. Part of what the village is about is building these networks within Santa Barbara. And part of what we've been in the process of doing for the past 14 months is both with nonprofit organizations like RSVP, building partnerships to actually expand volunteer opportunities, but also working with places of business to make whatever they're doing um, more friendly for populations that are uh, not 20 or 30 something. <laughs> it's just simply a way of recognizing this is a, a process. What, what we've heard, what the Village Board is all about is recognizing that this is a set of services for seniors. And many of us here are seniors. Some of us have limited ranges in mobilities, and that's another kind of a classification. We have family members who care about us and want to care for us, and some of them are adult children that uh, take that responsibility both legally and informally. How do you get that help? Is whether you live in Santa Barbara or whether they live somewhere else and how to do that. First hand, I've seen what seems like a set of small household services, which one could say, well, that's what the village, well, yeah, when you're caring for a senior, especially one with any kind of health challenges, that's really what you're talking about. The big stuff can get taken care of, like through the hospital or something, Well, but it's like all that stuff, like in between those big episodes, that's called life, and wouldn't it be great to have a friend, a whole, organization in a sense that's ready to pitch in and help wow and part of it is so you've got you've got the senior you've got the family you've got neighbors just like you were talking about wanting wanting to have a wider circle of people to interact with the book clubs and the other pieces and the other piece is a community-wide one which is talking about two businesses and other establishments about how do you make your place of business, this community in general, more accessible and more useful and more friendly to a wider range of audiences, as opposed to just thinking of people, as Naomi was saying earlier, in really small little segments, but rather looking at this as an entire community in, in every width and depth sort of a view. And that's what we're trying to do. That's where this is all going. I find both the people who are handicapped do not get out, get involved in community activities. And it's very possible that they may be very intelligent, but not able to voice as quote normal people do. We really encourage all of our members to be involved in whatever they want to within the village and um, to get out and to socialize and to connect. And, you know, just because you might have a handicap doesn't mean that you shouldn't be social, that you shouldn't be involved. We want to encourage that. You know, just the heart of the village movement is really about the individual and who you show up as as an individual and how do we 
help you to maximize the great things that you bring to the table? You know, I'm just as independent as the next person. I'm on the go, I have lots of interests and lots of things that I like to do. I already know that what my encore career is going to be in graphics design. I'm very excited about that. Can't wait till I'm 70 to be able to start that. Um, and all the assets and, and wonderful values that you bring, and things and talents that you bring that you can impart to other people, but also what, what can others do for you to help also create that space where you can really be an individual. So I think that's what's really great about the village movement too. Just along the, the same lines there as your uh, question is letting the village know what your interests are so that you might for instance, I know somebody that likes to go to ukulele meetings, and that certainly wasn't one of my interests, but I started going <laughs> because that member wanted to go to that. So part of it, too, would be making sure you're asserting what your interests are so that you know, put those feelers out there, and that way it's geared towards your needs, your wants, and, and interests. I'm just curious, how many members do you have in the Santa Barbara Village? Yeah. Uh, we have 48 members right now, and we're, you know, always open to adding new members, and um, it ranges from individuals to two-person households. And you said you, you vet the people who want to join. How do you go through that process? Um, she asked about how we, that we vet, I mentioned that we vet people and wondered how we go through that process. Um, we basically sit down and say, what are you, what is your expectation of the village? What, what would your needs be? And um, we really talk about, to, we want people to be realistic. As I said, like we don't want somebody who thinks, oh, this means I pay my dues and I have a personal chef seven days a week. <laughs> and I have a chauffeur at my back and call every moment that I can. Well, in those cases, and we actually, I, I joke about that, but we have had somebody call and expect that. And we said, you know, we cannot deliver that. We're not going to cash your check. It, we, it's not realistic. So we want to make sure that, that the expectations somebody has with, with, for their membership, we can actually meet those expectations. And, and I will say sometimes um, we've had very uh, little, uh, I think in, we've had basically one member um, finish their membership early, terminate early, because memberships are for a year. And it, there was really uh, an issue about memory. And if, if somebody, and I, I don't say this jokingly, if somebody can't remember that they're a member, and can't remember what type of services or how to get the help, it really doesn't make sense for us to continue charging them a membership that they really don't have the capability of taking advantage of. So that's one of the things we try to um, ascertain as well is, is this person really going to be able to benefit from the village? Thank you so much. I have a question, uh, perhaps for Andy or for Candace, because they're a little bit about demographics. The first one is, um, which states in the United States seem to have more villages springing up? Is there a regional uh, tendency going on? <laughs> um, I would say that the village movement is very coast-centric, so it's very heavy on the west coast, east coast. Um, because the movement started in Boston, you've got probably more in the uh, New England kind of area. Um, we've seen a growth, I, I, the fastest growing probably, well, let's see. California's in competition with New, New York. Um, so you're one ahead. You know, I think it's just really great that this is a movement that's really grassroots and that these are people and the communities coming together to solve the problem that this is not waiting for someone some government agency or a large organization to come in with a prescriptive model to say here's how we're going to solve it one size does not fit all we're also seeing the washington dc area um, where i live the washington area uh, village exchange is actually a regional coalition of, of 58 organizations um, either organizations that are started as village and have been or communities in that area that want to start a village and so we, we're seeing a lot of growth um it's about the best answer i can give you because they're popping up we're seeing much more into uh, there's a large proportion of villages in chicago area uh, we're starting to see the growth in the midwest which is helpful because my father lives so i'm kind of hoping that he'll get involved too so we'll be covered yeah. 
That's yeah. great, thanks. I do have one other question about, yes. you had mentioned, this is fascinating, that there are other villages, I think you said that one is in Australia and yes. Netherlands as well. Yes, yes. Um, can you just briefly mention, are there considerable differences in the concerns, or it's always the same basic, like Andy's four areas of survey, it's the same thing? I, I found in, uh, when I went to Amsterdam, there were actually five in the Netherlands alone and one, a very strong group in, in Amsterdam. They are very much dealing with the same issues. A large population of aging, kind of age wave, not quite sure. Even their socialized medicine is, is you know, threatened solvency because of the, just the sheer number of people that are, are seeing that. Australia, um, there is, there's a group in Sydney, there's a group in Melbourne. I was in South Australia. Um, which is a state of Australia that is hugely growing and, and really trying to change their economy. Their uh, socialized medicine is going from like an HMO type model to more of a cash and carry, which is basically here's your check, go buy your own services. Um, and so in that respect, there's a lot of change happening as far as education, uh, consumer education, so that um, you know, you, you can make the right choices of what services do you go to provide as opposed to people telling you where you can go to get that. So there's not a lot of difference. Um, I, we find a lot more, um, I was actually sh surprised to see a lot higher incidence of dementia and cognitive impairment than in, in the Netherlands and Amsterdam than I was, that we see here. Um, a lot of uh, higher incident of hearing loss because of um, pieces of the population that grew up during World War II. And so we've seen a lot of that as well. Um, but at the same time, they have steps that are like 45 degree angle up to the second stairs. So I don't know how they're able to get up. And they're called ladders. They're called ladders. Um, and it's really crazy just to kind of see how are you going. I, I couldn't even get up and down some of their stairs. And my knees aren't that young, but they're not that old either. So you have any thoughts from I, I've been very interested in the, the village movement. I think it's got some fabulous concepts. I just have some concerns about the sustainability. Sure. And when you're talking about, okay, so the average age is 3.1 years, you haven't really had time to develop the data yet. Um, and still everybody looking at it. And the funding, uh, you know, is it sustainable as a model without foundation funding? Is it, is it are the villages going to be spending their, their energy in perpetuity, in fundraising, I mean, I've, I've run a nonprofit. I know how that can become all-consuming when you're also highly volunteer-based. Sure. So I don't know if Archstone, Archstone or, or um, Andy would like to, who, who would like to speak to that, those issues? We'll let you guys tackle I'll that. I'll start. Um, <laughs> You know, it is a nascent model. Uh, we are finding some really good organizations who have been in existence for five or more years. Beacon Hill's been around for 11. Um, Capitol Hill's celebrating their sixth anniversary. Lincoln Park Village in Chicago's a five year. So on, while the average is three years, there are a, a good number who have been able to make it past the five year mark and, and are sustainable. I think as in any nonprofit organization, you're gonna have the same sustainability challenges. I don't think it's unique to the village model per se. Um, what's really great about the village model is that because of, with a large incidence of, or large dependency upon membership dues, it creates an unrestricted funds that can be used a little more easily than what you find in more restricted foundation funding. And so you're always gonna have a portion of foundation funding but that can be targeted to specific programs um, as long as the membership continues to go. Our membership renewals on average are around 85 to 90 percent. So yes, it's sustainable as long as the members um, also put back into the membership and value their membership and use it as well. But I'll let Andy and, and Jolene talk. Yeah, and um, you know, part of what we are doing is to look exactly at what are the factors that contribute to sustainability and how do we build upon best practices that villages are using. But I, the, the main reason why I'm interested <coughs> in villages, personally and professionally, is because of the ways that it involves all of us as part of a community. Simply providing a, um, a group of people that are similar to yourself, that you want to be with and hang out with, and that where there's some structure that helps you to interact with them, where there's an organization that you feel part of and that you, you want to contribute to. 
and in a way that is somewhat different than traditional nonprofits, where we're not simply either volunteers or service recipients, but where we are part of a community. And it's that community connection and community commitment that has the potential, I think, to sustain these villages over time in a way that is a little bit different from traditional nonprofits. But for every village, they, these are the questions, these are the challenges. What's and the critical mass to, you know, that's what you think. And there, I mean, there are very real questions about what critical mass is. Uh, some people say, you know, 100 or more members, 150 members, something like that. But it, there, are, there are villages that are very small and stay very small. There are villages that are very large. So it's a great deal of variation. It's a, very, it's a real question, a very important question, but something that ultimately I think will be answered by the involvement of the members themselves and commitment of members themselves. I think also I would invite you to think about what sustainability means to your village. Um, as a member, you have a say in what that would look like. It, it's, as Candace will say, it's, it's not a destination. You're taking steps to get there. I was an executive director of a statewide association that was 30 plus years old. It started out in the basement of someone's home, and I refer to it as not being mom and pop, but more cousin. And so we then took a look at it and looked at how we could innovate it and how we could grow it. And, and, and what did, did sustainability look like to the association? Um, the R. Stone Foundation um, is now, we are, uh, we just sent out an RFP. We are inviting the nine villages to submit proposals for continuation funding for another 12 months. Um, we do believe in the village movement. We, we want to support the nine villages or continue to support them over the next um, 12 months or for an additional 12 months. So, yeah, um, okay, we'll wrap this up with... I just wanted to also say one other question. Having worked for 40 years with all the nonprofits in this county, when we finished towards the end of the Power of Partnership Initiative, we asked 300 nonprofits a question almost identical to what Andy's asked of the villages. Is um, The question is, is um, kind of... Uh, do you see yourself still in business 10 years from now? And the answer by well in excess of half of the nonprofits, 300 nonprofits, most of whom you all know the names so, of. I think the village is apparently, at least for the people in Santa Barbara County, what they have said, a number of them, over a thousand of them have said, we think this is a really good idea, probably one of the very best ideas we can think of to address this. So in the world of nonprofits, the whole future, if you will, of how all these synergistic and hopefully complementary services, because it's the person requires all this multiple levels and types of service, and we've come through the last 50 or 80 years of nonprofit work where everybody does their own little silo of service, and yet this whole huge age wave is requiring this layering and changing and merging and stuff. So most nonprofits understand it's got to be different going forward. So they're fully prepared and have discussed openly in meetings just like this the fact that they're not going to look like they looked 10 years ago. Yes, definitely. It, it, it's interesting seeing the, the face and the scape of it change. Um, I know there were a few other questions. I would like to, before she has to leave, um, introduce Second District County Supervisor Janet Wolf, who um, I'm really appreciative of. Uh, I also wanted to recognize that Stephanie Langsdorf, who uh, is one of the assistants for Third District Supervisor Doreen Farr, was here today with us, but she had to duck out. And um, First District Supervisor Salud Carbajal had a family engagement, as did his staffer. So they uh, sent their regrets, but they wanted everybody to know that they're very interested in uh, the topic of today. So I will be meeting with them to talk about it. 
Thank you, Naomi. It's wonderful to be here. And as Naomi mentioned, um, the three South County supervisors, um, and, and I think I can speak for all the supervisors, have a tremendous interest in making sure that the needs of our uh, senior citizens are being met in a variety of ways. Um, we oversee the Social Services Department of the county. Um, myself, I'm on the CENCAL board that oversees Medi-Cal reimbursements and follow-up services for those who are receiving treatment in hospitals or, or in their home. I've known Naomi for, I, I feel like, maybe 20, 25 <laughs> years. And um, having someone like Naomi at the helm of this organization means so much, and it's a tremendous asset. I think the essence of what will make this group work, what will make um, this this community work is is having Naomi here and also the fact that we are in Santa Barbara. I think the nature of the Santa Barbara community is to help one another and here what we have is an organized network of helping each other. So I'm confident that this, um, this program is just this village is um, just going to take off, and it's a remarkable model, and I, I thank you and all of you for everything that you've done, and to all of you for being here. I, I, I learned a great deal. I thought I knew a lot, but you know, you can, <laughs> Naomi's so incredible. Oh, so thank, thank you so much. Thank you. It's certainly nice having the support of our county supervisors and, and a lot of the organizations in town. Um, really collaborating with us and being there, um, us for them and them for us. Again, it's all about reciprocity and community. Please, if you had other questions, if it was for a, one for me or one of our speakers, please come up and talk to us. Um, I really want to encourage you to sign up for our email newsletter. If you're on email, you'll get e-blasts that tell you what events are coming up and what we're up to. So even if you're not a member, some of those are open to the public. We'd love to see you at future events and just let you know what's going on with the village. And thank you for sharing your afternoon with us. Have a wonderful day. And, uh, thank you to our speakers. Thank you. A resource. Health, prevention, wellness. Community. Enriching. Caring. Connection. A leadership and engagement within your community. Thoughtfulness. Security. Integrative. Vibrant. It's like a family. And I think in a lot of ways that's really important.